medcram.com. Hey guys, welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Today we're going to talk about the VAERS registered death curve for the mRNA vaccines. We're looking at an early version here that was done about six months into the vaccination campaign. And I think there's real data here that we have to answer for, especially in light of the fact that there are more COVID-19 boosters coming down the pipe. I think it's well worth our attention and probably a video that's well overdue. So you're probably wondering, who am I and why should I be commenting on this? I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm quadruple board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, pulmonary disease, and sleep medicine, also the co-founder of MedCram.com. And we've been making videos since the pandemic, very interested in, for instance, things like early treatment with our top 10 tips if you get COVID-19, describing things that one could do at home if they came down with symptoms. In it, we talk about pulse oximetry, even things like hydrotherapy. This was before a lot of the treatment had come out. We also talked about Paxlovid, and we described the case for sunlight and COVID. We also talked about the boosters, especially during Omicron, whether you want to prevent the worst outcomes, which is hospitalization or infection, and whether or not you're immunocompromised or you've had natural immunity or vaccination before and are pretty healthy. That's a decision that should be made between the patient and their physician. We've always been in favor of that. The whole purpose of education is so people can make their own choices. We also talked a lot about other treatments, other preventives in our update 46 and 47, which looked at hydrotherapy and heating up the body and the evidence for that and the past evidence for that, especially with the pharmacokinetics and other aspects of COVID-19, including interferon suppression and what heat can do to increasing interferon. On. We also talked about long COVID after we started seeing more of those and made some videos about evidence that in long COVID there is bad fat metabolism that is in the mitochondria and talked about the diagnosis and treatment and that's becoming more. And we also talked about some of the genetic issues in terms of why some get COVID-19 and others don't. So if you like this channel, we really would like your support. We don't get any funding whatsoever from pharmaceutical companies. You can check actually my open access on CMS and see exactly how much money I'm getting from pharmaceutical companies. We don't get any money. But we do get money from physicians, healthcare providers, and the lay public going to medcram.com and signing up for our continuing medical education seminars, where we talk about EKG, congestive heart failure, acid base, asthma, COPD, reading pulmonary function tests. If you are enjoying these things, please support us. And if you need CME, you should consider medcram.com. It's one of the best CME providers out there. Let's jump in. What is the VAERS? It's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It's very important because it's really the main way that if there's an adverse event, anybody can put a report in to the main database. Now, it's not easy to do. There's a lot of pages involved, and you have to be pretty tenacious to get through it. We'll talk more about why there's significant underreporting. This is from their own website here. VAERS accepts reports of adverse events that occur following vaccination. So it doesn't have to be just COVID-19. It could be any vaccination. Today, we're going to talk about specifically the COVID-19 vaccines and more specifically the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. They say that anyone, including healthcare providers, vaccine manufacturers, and the public can submit reports to the system. While very important in monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. Vaccine providers are encouraged to report any clinically significant health problems following vaccination to VAERS, even if they are not sure if the vaccine was the cause. In some situations, reporting to VAERS is required of healthcare providers and vaccine manufacturers. It says that VAERS reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. Reports to VAERS can also be biased. As a result, there are limitations on how the data can be used scientifically. Data from VAERS reports should always be interpreted with these limitations in mind. Let me just put it to you bluntly. If anything happens to anybody that's ever gotten a vaccine afterwards, it can be reported to VAERS. Deaths to hangnails. All of it goes in there. And what they're trying to do is see what the frequency is in the population and then see what the frequency is in terms of reporting and decide whether or not there is an increase in risk. Understanding, of course, that a lot of things are going to be underreported. They go on here, they say the number of reports alone cannot be interpreted as evidence of causal association between a vaccine and an adverse event or as evidence about the existence, severity, frequency, or rates of problems associated with the vaccines. What we're doing here is we're running a study where reports about the vaccine are coming in, but we have no idea what the control arm is. There is no control arm. All we're getting is reports about people who have received the vaccine and what happens to them afterwards. 
It does not contain follow-up records. The data is limited to the report itself, and it does not represent all known safety information for a vaccine and should be interpreted in the context of other scientific information. That being said, it has proven to be very useful. Back in April of 2021, during the campaign of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, as you may recall, there was about six cases out of six million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine where there was a intracranial clot formation. And we actually did a video on that, highlighting the fact that that was a potential side effect. So it's important to know side effects. There is no intervention that doesn't have risk. Even drinking water too quickly can cause harm. And so it's important that we have these systems set up so we can monitor them and make sure that we're not causing harm unnecessarily. Everything is a risk-benefit ratio. I'll give you the example of anticoagulation. We put people all the time on anticoagulation because they're at risk for getting stroke, because they may have atrial fibrillation. We risk stratify them using a CHADS2 VAS scoring system. And if they are in a category where they are highly susceptible to getting blood clots, we'll anticoagulate while we let those that are low risk go without anticoagulation because we don't want to cause excess harm. Anytime you're on an anticoagulant, you could bleed. As an intensive care physician in the ICU, I see people bleeding all the time on blood thinners. And yet we don't go out and shut down production of blood thinners because we know that it saves lives. We know that it saves strokes. We know that because of epidemiological studies and randomized controlled trials that show that. We need to be able to be aware of whether or not there are side effects. So for the mRNA vaccines, we've already discussed this. Myocarditis is a potential side effect. Generally speaking, in males, generally speaking, in those younger than 40, and those typically on their second dose, particularly with Moderna, that was a British study that was published with over 42 million subjects in that study. What we need to do is take a look at this data and see if we can make sense of what's going on. So this is a graph of the number of people in the United States, specifically, who received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. This includes both the mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, and also Johnson & Johnson. Although the Johnson & Johnson is maybe 5 to 10% at most, the majority of this is Pfizer and Moderna. And you can see here that we're approaching 250 to 300 million people. That's a huge population. And so what we can do in these situations is if we don't have a control group, we can estimate or find the expected control group incidence of side effect. Let's take a look at that graph again, and specifically the data with that graph. That graph was a graph of six months, and we're actually going to look at a specific graph from a study that looks at a similar graph. So this is the first six months of data that we're going to use, and I use this because we have the most data from the first six months. From December 14, when mRNA vaccines were first introduced, so Pfizer particularly, and then a little bit later Moderna, to June 14, that's exactly six months, a total of 298.8 million mRNA COVID-19 vaccine doses were given in the United States. And I'll just stop there. We got to understand the difference between doses and people. We need to follow people because it's people that can die. We're not interested so much in doses. It's people. So just be aware of that as we go on here. Of these, 169.6 million were from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and 129.2 million were from the Moderna vaccine. The majority of the vaccines were given to females at 53.2%, then males, 45.8%. Make a mental note of this. We'll come back to this later. The median vaccination age the first six months was 50 years for the Pfizer-BioNTech dose and 56 years for the Moderna. So basically, the median was in the 50s. The median age of this subpopulation of people in the United States that were vaccinated by six months' time with an mRNA vaccine was generally in the 50s. This is the graph in question. Here we are looking at the number of reported deaths by days after a dose for mRNA vaccines. Notice it doesn't say days since the first dose. It says days since the last dose. That's going to become important later because most of the people who got an mRNA vaccine actually got two doses. What you're looking at here is six months of data. So that's 183 days of people being vaccinated. And what you're looking at is the number of VAERS death reports that have come in. And on the death report, it states when did the patient get the vaccine and when did the patient die? And that's simply a number that they put into the calculus and then they graph it. And this is what it looks like. This is alarming. It looks as though when the vaccine is given, that's when you're getting the most amount of deaths here, especially at day one, and then it tapers off as it goes away. This is why we need to take a look at this very carefully to see what it is that's going on. 
The point here, though, is this is a tremendous amount of people getting this vaccine in six months time. We're going to take a look and see how many people those were. But before we go on to that, what we need to do is talk about the philosophy of the control group and how we go about doing this. And this is not new science. This has been around for a very long time. And it has to do with this idea that if you know the total population of a country, in this case, the United States, and you know the total number of people that have died in that time period, you can come up with a rate. And that rate is going to include the number of people per 100,000 per year that die. What you can do then is you can take that same rate, which should not change, and you can apply it to a subpopulation and then come up with the idea of how many people in that population would be expected to die if the populations are similar. This is something that insurance companies do. This is something that medical groups do. Like if a medical group is going to take liability for a population of people, they're going to need to know how many people in this population of 300,000 is going to need a heart transplant. How many people are going to need a liver transplant? How many people are going to need ECMO? How many people are going to be in the intensive care unit? And they can take these general ideas from the population and make anticipatory budgets based on how they're going to need to take care of these people. Here is an article from actuaries about why they're so interested in population issues. This is exactly how they're able to predict how much money they're going to have to spend on a population. Obviously, the bigger the subsample size, the more accurate is going to be if you know the results of the total population. And this is an excellent example here where the subpopulation that we're talking about are people that got vaccinated with the mRNA vaccine, and the total population is the total population of the United States. So how do we go to the rates? Let's take a look at that. This is rates by age group, and the first thing I want you to notice here is it's deaths per 100,000 population. Notice it's logarithmic. So this is not linear. As you get older, your chances of dying per year go up dramatically. That should not be a surprise to you, but let's take a look at some examples here. Let's see if you're 25 to 34. In any group of 100,000, if you were to follow them for 365 days, 180 of them would be dead in 2021. And as you can see here, as we go up in age range, every 10-year grouping, you can see that this is practically doubling, more than doubling, it seems, when you get to 85. And so if you wanted to look at the death rate on average in the United States, you can see here that these are some age-adjusted death rates. This would be the death rate on average for anybody. And in 2021, it was 879.7 deaths per 100,000 people per year. So that's sort of the baseline rate that you're going to see. If we're going to look at a control group, let's look at the control group and apply the death rate in the year that we're looking at the vaccination. That would be the most logical thing to do. I could hear someone saying, but wait a minute, if the vaccine is killing people and you want to know what the baseline rate is, then you don't want to use the rate from 2021. You should be using the rate from like 2019. That's before COVID. That's before the vaccine. That's the pure death rate. That's fine. I understand that. So we could use 715.5 and that's why I have it listed here. So we'll do the calculation both ways. But there's something that I want you to be aware of, and that is the median age of this population. So the median age in the United States has been increasing, but in 2019, it was 38.4, and in 2021, it was 38.8. Do you remember what the median age was of our population that got vaccinated? It was in the 50s. Chances are that whether we use the 879 or the 715, it's probably less than the true adjusted death rate. Those people that got vaccinated were older. Many of them were in nursing homes. It's probably closer to 1,000, but I'm going to be conservative and I'm going to use the 2019 data and the 2021 data to demonstrate what it is that I'm talking about. Look at these death rates. It varies by age. It is logarithmic. These are the adjusted death rates in a population of people who are going. It's for 38.8 years. Our population is about 12 years older than that, at least. So it's probably higher in terms of the median. But I'll be conservative, and we're going to use both 715 and 879. Let's take a look at the causes of death, just so we can be sure. And I've put down 2019 here, 2020, and 2021. In 2021, the causes of death, heart disease. In 2019, the biggest cause of death, heart disease. In 2020, the biggest cause of death, heart disease followed by cancer, followed by accidents, stroke, chronic respiratory disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. COVID-19 in 2021 was seventh. If you'll notice back in 2020, it was actually third behind cancer, which is astounding. The point is, is that if somebody were to have gotten the vaccine and then they were to have died of heart disease, typically heart disease could happen all of a sudden. 
It could have happened very slowly. You could die of a heart attack very quickly, or you could die of congestive heart failure very slowly, or you could die of an arrhythmia very quickly. So it's likely that these types of deaths after a vaccination would be generally more likely to be reported. Cancer, generally speaking, people know when they're going to die of cancer. And so it may or may not have been reported. I can see maybe if someone had cancer and they weren't doing well and they got a vaccine and then maybe a day or two later they died. Even though they died of cancer on the death certificate, I could see perhaps how it might be reported. It might not be reported. And as we'll talk about later, there's severe underreporting. Accidents, I think that would probably be less likely. Like say someone got vaccinated and they got into a car accident. Would that be reported? Probably not. Stroke, that could certainly be reported. Chronic lower respiratory disease, may or may not. That's usually a slow. Alzheimer's disease is pretty slow. Diabetes depends on the mode of death. If they're in the hospital and they're dying on a ventilator and they had the vaccine a week before, it's possible they could have reported diabetes and then, of course, other respiratory illnesses. But I just want to get you the flavor here of what the underlying basal rate is of reporting of deaths. Let's get some actual numbers here. As we said, this study looked at the first six months of data, 183 days of vaccination. We'll see here that on the 183rd day, which was June 14, I looked this up here on Our World in Data, 11.61 million people had the J&J vaccine by 614. So we want to exclude those people from this analysis because we're looking at just mRNA because that's the graph that we have. We also have data from USA Facts that on that very day, 174.2 million Americans had at least one dose of a vaccine and 144.9 million were fully vaccinated. That would include those that got the Johnson & Johnson and those that had two shots of Moderna. So what we could do to find out how many people had at least one shot of the mRNA and how many people had two shots of the mRNA would simply take 11.61 million, subtract that amount from each of these numbers, and then we should have our numbers. On June 14, 2021, what we can do is take 174.2 million, subtract out the J&J &J people, and now we have 162.6 million people got at least one dose of an mRNA vaccine. And if we take the fully vaccinated and take out the Johnson & Johnson people, we'll have 133.3 million people that had two doses of the mRNA vaccine. This is before we had boosters. 82% of those that had one shot went on to have their second shot. That'll come in handy later. So 82% of those that had at least one shot of the vaccine went on to have two shots of the vaccine. Let's go now to our graph. This is where we have to get a little bit technical and mathematic. Let's just review. This is all the deaths that were reported to VA ERS over a six-month period of time for just mRNA vaccines versus the days since the last dose. So total people that we're talking about here, the total amount of people that are represented in this graph that got vaccinated is 162.6 million people. The median age in the United States was 38.8. In 2019, it was 38.1. However, the median age in this cohort is older, probably a higher death rate, but we're going to be conservative and use the same death rate. And there was a total of 183 days. So because this graph represents an entire cumulative display of everything that happened in six months time, just for making this illustrative, let's say that on day one, which was December 14, they vaccinated the same amount of people throughout that entire time all the way through to June 14. So how many people would that be per day? Take 162.6 million people and divide it by 183 days. And so that would mean on average, they were vaccinating 888,525 people every day for 183 days to come up with this graph. All I did there was just take the number of people that had gotten a dose of the vaccine, the total number of people. I don't care about the number of doses. That's a much bigger number. I want the actual people because people are the ones that die and you can only die once. We take the number of people, 162.6 million, and you know how we got there. And we divide it evenly over the number of days that they did the campaign over to get to this analysis. That was 183 days. We are vaccinating 888,525 people every day. So this is going to be a population every single day for 183 days. That's a completely different population. There's going to be 183 different cohorts, each one with their own day. And each one of them is going to be followed for 161 days. Notice what it says here. The x-axis reports through 160 days since the last dose. We'll come to that later. 
there is 183 cohorts. Each cohort holds in it 888,525. And each one of those, after the 183rd day, that last cohort is going to be followed like everybody else for 161 days. And all the reports that are come in are going to be graphed. And here is the graph. Let's take a look here, see what we do next. It's a massive amount of people who are getting vaccinated, as we said. So again, we take the total population, the rate, and the number of people, we apply it to the subpopulation, and we should get the number of people that we should expect to be dying on a daily basis. We're just taking the rate, we're applying the rate. Now, I said I was going to be conservative about that rate, so let's take a look here. We are going to take these two rates, the rate for 2021, and for those that say, no, you got to be pure about this and take the rate in 2019, we'll do that. You'll see in the end, it's not going to really make that much of a difference. For 2021, the death rate was 879.7 deaths per 100,000 population per year. This is just dimensional analysis. One year crosses out, and we have the amount of people that we should expect to die on a daily basis in any population in the United States based on the death rates of 2021. It's 0 0.00002410. If you actually do the math on this, it will tell you that if you take any group of 50,000 people in a specific day, one of those people on average will die by the end of the day. That's basically what it's telling you. You can think about baseball stadiums, but remember the people that show up to baseball stadiums are typically not people in nursing homes, people not in the hospital. So generally you don't get that on a daily basis. Someone's not dying every day at a baseball game. So it's a little bit of a subpopulation. Remember, the population that we're talking about that's getting vaccinated, these are people that were pretty ill chronically and they're older. And remember, we're using a pretty conservative number here. So for 2019, it was 715.5 people per 100,000 people per year. And let me just stop right here. We're talking about dead people as if they're just statistics and numbers. I just want to be clear that these are real people with real lives and families. So I don't want to be disrespectful in any way. These are people that have loved ones. But what we're trying to do here is figure out whether or not these deaths are related to the vaccine by looking at the underlying control group. I may use these terms flippantly, but realize I've taken care of people in the hospital, and I understand that this is a significant problem. Okay, year crosses out, year crosses out. Now we have the rate for those in 2019, and it's 0 0.00001960. Now, just check my math. You can make sure that it's right. So what does this mean? What this means then is if we are vaccinating this many people per day and we have a death rate per day, we simply multiply the total subpopulation times the rate and we should get the number of people that should die on that day and every day, regardless of what happens to them. So if they were to come in and get a red sticker on their head or a saline injection, this is the amount of people that we would expect to die on any given day whether they're in for a vaccine on day one, or it's been three weeks since their vaccine, or it's been two months since their vaccine. This is the amount of people that should be dying per day. Should be 21.4 if we use the 21 rates, should be 17.4 if we use the 2019 rates. And again, we're pretty conservative on this. So let's construct a graph that would resemble this. It's December 14. It's our first cohort. We've smoothed everything out. So now we're getting the first batch of people that are coming in, and it's 888,525 people are coming in. What I want to do is construct a graph as if we had 100% reporting for deaths. Every single death was reported regardless of what the death was or how the death happened. What would be the expected amount of deaths given the population that got vaccinated? So let's take a look at that. We've already said that for 888,525, if we use 2021 rates, there should be about 21.4 people dead on the day that they got vaccinated. But I'm just going to put a little line down here on day zero, because look at my scale here. That's 1,000, that's 2,000, that's 3,000. There's a reason why I did that. So I'm going to put a little dot there. Most people who got vaccinated got vaccinated during business hours. These are calendar days down here at the bottom. Business hours runs from about 8 to 5. On any given day, anyone that gets vaccinated, if you were to average all the times of everybody that got vaccinated in that day, it would come around to about noon or 1 o'clock. Some people got vaccinated at 8, some people got vaccinated at 5. But the average time would be 12. And so it makes sense then that if time zero is already halfway through day zero, there's less time for someone to die. There's half the amount of time for someone to die at noon than there is if you start counting at midnight because of the calendar day. And I just want you to notice already that day zero is about half the amount of the first full day, which is actually day one. But let's go back. 
Our first group comes in on December 14th and they get vaccinated. Let's say since it's half of a day on average that only 10 people die. So we put a little dot of 10 people down there. And then the next day, since it's a full day, and because of that population, we would expect another 21.4 people to die, or 17.4 if you want the 2019 group data. But then the next day, we would expect exactly the same thing. Day three, exactly the same thing. In fact, every single day that this population is followed, all the way across, we would expect them to be dying continuously. Now notice, they're dying at the rate of about 20 a day. That's not going to significantly change the denominator here by the time you get to 160 days. They're only following about 161 days out, which is going to be right here. None of this gets followed. That's the first cohort that came in on December 14. Now we have to look at the cohort that came in on December 15. That's a completely different cohort. That's another 888,525 people. Completely different. And so they also are going to have the same amount of deaths. 21.4 or 17.4, however you want it, going all the way across. In fact, you're going to have to do this for every cohort for 183 days. So much so that eventually you're going to have to stack all of these up. What you're going to get if you use 2021 death rates or 2019 death rates, every day 21.4 people are dying in each cohort and you have 183 cohorts. So if you really want to know what the total number of deaths should be on any given day, it should be actually around 3,916. In other words, 2021 would be right about there and 2019 would be right about there, depending on which data you use. But there's something else that we haven't even talked about. Notice it says here, days since last dose. So it actually gets even more complicated because the Pfizer vaccine made you come back and get a second dose at 21 days, which is right where this black arrow is. And Moderna made you come back and get a dose after 28 days. Some people actually did a little bit after that. So in fact, what you would normally see is not this going straight across, but actually it would go across. And then when you got to your second dose, that population, or at least 82% of that population, we talked about 82% got the second dose, 18% would continue on, but 82% would get to the end of this course and then they would go back to the first day again and they would go on top of their own line. In other words, the data prior to day 21 and the data prior to day 28 from Moderna is actually amplified by almost twice because the population goes through two day ones and two day twos all the way up to that number. And so, in fact, it's actually up to 7,100 until day 21, and then it comes down to some midpoint because half of the vaccinations were Moderna, approximately and half were Pfizer to day 28, and then it comes down, depending on which death rate you want to look at, it comes down to this. And so, this is what the death rate would look like if 100% of all of the deaths were reported in that population, even if we gave them saline if we put a rubber stamp on them, if we put a red dot on their forehead, if we injected regular saline into their arm, this is what, if all of the deaths were ever reported, regardless of the cause, 100% reporting would give you this type of a graph, the way that this graph is constructed. Notice it's not days since the first dose, it's days since the last dose. And because there are two doses required for mRNA, this is exactly what you're gonna see. Let's see if we can see that here on the actual graph. Right at day 21, that's the black arrow, the Pfizer vaccine. The number of deaths reported for Pfizer, which is represented by that black line after that day 21, it's much smaller. And that's because these black lines prior to day 21, the cohort of people vaccinated passed through this twice because they were vaccinated twice. For Moderna, notice right after this, there's a drop off and you can see the average height of the blue reporting, which is Moderna, also becomes smaller. If you can't see that, I'll blow that up for you so you can see it here more clearly. Notice that the black lines here become smaller afterwards and stay small. The blue lines are large here, and then they drop down down here. If this is 100% reporting, this is how the graph is going to look, something like this. And then it's going to go down to something like this. Now imagine on top of that, we add in where there is underreporting. Where is underreporting going to be more prevalent? Is it going to be when the death is reported very far away from the vaccine dose or very close to the vaccine dose? 
Well, in actuality, you're going to have significant, significant underreporting. And so there's going to be a much greater burden of underreporting the further out you are from the vaccine dose. And as you get closer to the vaccine dose, the underreporting is going to become less and less and less and less. And so what you will get is something that looks like this. And that's exactly what we have here. Notice again here, the total number of deaths that you would expect on this graph is over 7,000. That's as if you had injected saline. And this is just based on the prevalent baseline death rates. And these were pretty conservative baseline death rates. We could have gone higher and we had license to do so because that population that was vaccinated was actually much older than the median age in the United States. So here it's over 7,000. And here we're seeing a peak reporting of just over 450 with a significant drop off afterwards. So let's see what VAERS has to say about underreporting. They say here it's one of the main limitations of passive surveillance systems, including the VAERS. And specifically, they say here that only a small fraction of actual adverse events are reported. If we're talking about mild adverse reactions, those are going to be really underreported. I would imagine that deaths would not be as underreported as others, but I'm sure still significantly underreported. And we'll actually do an analysis here very shortly to show you how underreported deaths have to be just based on baseline death rates. Let's look at this report. During those six months, how many total reports did they get? 4,472 non-duplicate reports of deaths that were made to VAERS. And actually, 46.7% of them came from Pfizer, and 53.3% of them came from Moderna. If you go back, you'll notice here that the reports are front-loaded. The reason why they're front-loaded in part is because of the temporal bias of reporting. You're going to report an event closer to the vaccination. Moderna may have shot themselves in the foot, maybe not. By making the second dose further out, more of their death reporting from Moderna was doubled, whereas with Pfizer, less of it was doubled. Only 21 days was doubled for Pfizer, but 28 days at least was doubled for Moderna. That might be the reason mathematically why the majority of the deaths came in for Moderna. I don't think it actually has anything to do with the product versus Pfizer. If this, in fact, was related to the underlying base rate of death in the United States, you would imagine that the majority of the people dying after vaccination would be the same type of people that you would expect dying from natural causes. So older people, people in long-term care facilities. And in fact, that was exactly the case. They said here that more than 80% of the reported deaths came from people who are 60 years old or older. The median age was 76, so that checks out. Approximately 18.3% of reported deaths came from residents admitted to long-term care facilities. That would also make sense. These are talking about the ones that were reported. They talk about here a subsection of cases most likely to die 10 days after vaccination. I'm not sure exactly where they're getting that from, though they say that the greatest number of deaths occurred a day or two after vaccination. The number of reports significantly below what we would expect to see at baseline. And I think the authors of this paper that got published see the same thing. What they said here was compared to expected background rates of death from all causes per million vaccinated persons. These are the background rates that we calculated. Death reports to VAERS following mRNA vaccination were consistently up to 30 times less frequent within seven days of vaccination and 50 times less frequent within 42 days of vaccination by age. And that's exactly what we were just showing you. We were showing you that here the death rates are approaching the mid 400s. And we would expect just based on baseline rates that if everyone was reporting, it should be closer to 7,000 a day. Also true to form is if these people are dying because of baseline rates, we should expect the cause of death to be similar to the baseline rates. That was cardiac disease and death of the diseases of the heart and COVID-19 infection, 12.6%. So here is a paper that was published in The Lancet that looks over exactly the same data that we did, and we just analyzed it. Let's see if they come to the same conclusion. This is a peer-reviewed paper that was published. They say here, in our review and analysis of death reports to VAERS following mRNA vaccination, we found no unusual patterns in cause of death among death reports received. 
Under the COVID-19 vaccine EUA regulations, healthcare providers are required to report deaths and life-threatening adverse events after COVID-19 vaccinations to VAERS, regardless of their potential association with vaccination. Those requirements make comparing the number of reported deaths to VAERS for COVID-19 vaccines with reported deaths following other adult vaccines difficult because no other adult vaccines have been so widely administered under FDA EUAs. Now, despite that, let's take a look at the amount of underreporting. We actually do a calculation here. Here we have 162.6 million people, and we look at the death rate of 2021 and the death rates of 2019, multiplied it by 183 days, we should get a total during that period of time of 717,115 dead, just based on regular rates of people dying. What is that in terms of underreporting? That's a 160-fold underreporting to VAERS. Here, 130-fold underreporting. What I'm saying here again, let me be clear. The number of deaths that we're seeing reported to VAERS is significantly below the amount of death that we should expect to see just by baseline rates. In other words, if somebody came in to get a saline injection and we did the same analysis, if everyone was reporting, and of course they don't, we should be seeing these types of numbers being dead. And again, this is baseline. This is not increased above the baseline. I am not saying that vaccine injuries don't happen. We've made videos on the vaccine injuries that can happen. I'm trying to explain this curve that we see on this graph. Explain the features of this curve. Why, for instance, is this first bar half of the second bar? Why is there a drop-off at these positions? There's reasons for all of this, and it has to do with what it is that's generating these death reports at least part of what's generating these death reports. Is it possible that there are actual vaccine-related injuries in these death reports? Absolutely, there could very well be. That's going to be a difficult thing to tease out from this type of data. But I want to put this graph into context about what it is that we may be seeing here and why we're seeing it. So they go on to basically make the same points that we were talking about, that initially they put 65 years and older in there, so this is an older population. They have a higher mortality risk. They say here that it's similar to the general mortality in the adult population. Reporting rates for deaths in this analysis increase with increasing age. The concentrated reporting of deaths on the first few days after vaccination follows patterns similar to those observed for other adult vaccinations. And you can look up that report. We're going to put a link to this article in the description below so you can follow up on these links. This peaking at the beginning is not unusual for vaccines because deaths happen all the time. And of course, if you're asking for reporting, it's going to be higher, closer to the actual vaccine administration. They say here this pattern might represent reporting bias because the likelihood to report a serious adverse event might increase when it occurs in close temporal proximity to vaccination. Now, this is an interesting paragraph here. They say that there are limitations in any review of preliminary data concerning reports of death following vaccination. A comparison with national mortality data suggests that certain causes of death, such as accidents, suicides, or cancer, are less likely to be reported to VAERS. This is what we were talking about before. Underreporting to VAERS in general is expected, and the predominance of heart disease as a cause of death reported to VAERS warrants continued monitoring and assessment, but might be driven by nonspecific causes, such as cardiac arrest. That might be chosen as a terminal event if no immediate explanation for death was available. So they're saying here that cardiac deaths in general are common, but it may be causing a cover-up, if you will, of some of the causes of death because it's being put under that diagnosis. Death certificate or autopsy reports were available for only a small proportion of deaths reported to VAERS when our analysis were conducted. Finally, VAERS is designed as an early warning system to detect potential safety signals. And we showed you that for the J&J &J vaccine and how that came about. And VAERS data alone generally cannot establish causal relationships between vaccination and adverse events. Another surveillance system called the VSD showed no increased risk of non-COVID-19 mortality in vaccinated people. And by the way, the authors of this declared no conflicting interests. So I wanted you to learn a little bit more about what it was that went into this curve. I think this curve appears this way because of the way that they set up the x-axis, number one, with the days since the last dose instead of the days since the first dose. And because of that, there was a multiplying of this group here because the cohort had to go through that once again when they got their second vaccine. 
and people that would regularly be dying anyway because of a baseline rate contributed to this portion of the graph being elevated by almost 82% more because 82% chose to get the second dose of the vaccine. Another reason is 130 to 160 time underreporting that we calculated. As things move out away from the vaccination event, reporting is going to be much, much less. And that's the third point. So again, I don't want this in any way to take away from the possibility that adverse events could be happening. I know that they have happened. I've had patients myself in my clinic that had a bad reaction after their first dose, and they were part of the 18% that did not get the second dose at my recommendation. But I want to make it clear that this graph does not indicate that in six months of data, people within one day of getting the vaccine, that 450 of them died because they got the vaccine. That is not what this graph is showing. I'd be interested to hear what your comments are on this evaluation, things that you would do differently and what numbers you might have used and maybe what factors I didn't take into consideration. Thank you for joining us once again, and don't forget to join us at medcram.com for more continuing medical education lectures.